Today, what I want to talk about is something which is happening in the background. It's, it's actually been happening for most of your lives, strangely enough, what they call unconventional monetary policies. And it's still all that governments are doing to try to control the state of the economy. They've, they're, they've abandoned uh, and they still haven't come back to the idea of using fiscal policy. I want to talk a bit about why that's happened and whether these policies will work and what are they like. And it also will challenge part of what you've been taught in your principles course so far. Have you done the money multiplier yet? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, okay. Do you think it makes sense? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show you that it doesn't. Okay. Uh, so, like, what, what, what this, this is going to force you to do something which you'll find yourself doing repeatedly in future years, so just take a note of it. Some of the models you learn in economics are models. They're not good ones, okay? but they're models that you have to say you can reproduce them for an exam. Okay? So I'm going to show you why the, why the money by multiplier model doesn't work, why it's a bad model, but you still when you do an exam on that topic, unless you're asked to criticise it, just reproduce it. In some ways, if you find who finds it a bit strange to understand the money multiplier, anybody, or it's, it seems pretty straightforward to you. Straightforward, okay. Straightforward, but wrong, and I'll show you why in today's lecture. So, um, and I hope it'll make it easier to understand. Let's talk about it when I get to that particular point. But if you if you look at where uh, we were when the crisis hit, the attitude of a conventional economist at this stage was: there's nothing other than monetary policy. That's all that matters, and it's using what's called the Taylor Rule. Have you heard of the Taylor Rule? You haven't? Okay. Named after an economist called Taylor, of course. And it came out of a very simple paper where he said that it looks like what the Federal Reserve has done in the past is adjust the interest rate twice as fast as it thinks inflation is changing to try to reach what it sees as a natural rate of unemployment. And this was a, a major belief in mainstream economics, that the economy settles down to a natural rate, and it was their job to try to manage that. And if you look at the, the models that they built, you've heard of DSGE models before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, mainly in this course, I imagine, rather than the other ones you're doing at the moment. Okay, but the, there's three basic components to any DSG model. It tries to model the economy by taking a model of a firm and a model of a consumer and scaling it up to the macro economy. That's pretty much what's going on. So they have the idea of a utility maximising household, and the household's deciding how much labour to supply based on a trade-off between leisure, which is enjoyable, okay, doing not working, and working which generates an income and allegedly is not enjoyable. So that's the trade-off. It's a consumer maximisation of utility decision and it's supposed to happen, for, they're supposed to do it for the whole of time. They look forward and maximise the utility over the whole of time. On the other side, you have a firm effectively, a single firm scaled up and the single firm is deciding how much to produce to maximise the net present value of its profit stream over time. And then in the middle, you have a central bank. This is actually the models, the GSG models include a central bank as part of the model. And what they see that the central bank is doing is manipulating the interest rate to try to balance the utility maximising behaviour of the firms off against the profit maximising behaviour of the, of the, so the, the utility maximising behaviour of consumers against the profit maximising behaviour of the firms to reach this natural rate. That's the basic logic of the models. And... Why do they not have fiscal policy? Well, there's lots of reasons for that, much more than you would cover just in, one, in one, uh, one lecture, obviously. But they believe the policy was ineffective. And this came out of arguments that go back to Friedman. Remember I explained in a previous lecture how Friedman argued that inflation would run away if you tried to push employment below the natural rate, you'd get runaway inflation. That was the beginning of the set of arguments that became what's called rational expectations theory. Now, an essential part of rational expectations is that people have what they call forward-looking expectations. So rather than deciding what to do based on experience, you take information, feed that into a model in your head, and then forecast forward what you think is going to happen. And on the basis of that, that's how you decide what to do. Sound like what you do for breakfast? No. Okay, but that's, that's the model economists had. And it's common across both the very conservative, what are called freshwater economists, and the more liberal um, saltwater economists. And this is just, I'm taking a quote now from one of the major papers that put this whole idea forward about rational expectations. And I, want to, I don't want you to believe it, but I want you to see what they thought would happen if people have what they called forward-looking expectations. And the conclusion of this article was that there's no sense in which the authority, meaning the government, can conduct counter-cyclical policy. Now, all the stuff you've been reading about ISLM, 
aggregate de- some probably aggregate demand analysis where the government can change the level of demand. Yeah. Does that relate to what Mises said about the Hanford markets? Pardon? Does that relate to what Mises said? Mises. Markets. So, no, not really. Mises is really talking in a more uh, a, a sense of a philosophy about the government not, a, no, not being able to have enough information to know what it's doing. Uh, it's, it's, in a sense, it's reaching a similar conclusion to that. But it, reaches, it, it reaches the conclusion in the opposite way to Mises because Mises and Hayek and co. all talk about having limited information, uncertainty and not knowing the future. This bunch is reaching a similar conclusion, saying we have infinite information and we can predict the future. Okay? So it has the same outcome but very, very different foundation. So what's being said here is that, and I'll, you'll see why in a moment, you'll, you'll see the contrast with Mises in a second, they said there's no sense in which the authority has the option to conduct counter-cyclical policy. Why? Not because of the Mises' point that people don't have enough information. It's on the basis that you can't trick the public because the public has assumptions which are rational. And because of these rational expectations, there is no rule the government can follow to fool the public. In other words, the public knows how the economy operates. If the government tries to drive demand up, by boosting aggregate demand, the public will know that's what they're trying to do and do the opposite. Sound sensible? I okay. I assume that there's a lot more Pardon? knowledge about that. It's a lot of knowledge. It's not just a lot of knowledge. It's assuming that knowledge is accurate, okay, and it's common and everybody has the same model. Okay, so in my opinion, off with the fairies, okay, but this, this is the type of theory that meant they didn't see any need, any possibility of fiscal policy. So they said the authority can't exploit the Phillips curve for even one period. In other words, they worked in period senses, which means about three months. And they're saying because the, the public knows how the economy operates and feeds us into a model which accurately describes the economy, any attempt to try to move the economy away from its natural rate will fail because the public will move in the opposite direction. This is a combining the natural rate hypothesis, which is the argument there's a natural rate of unemployment the economy naturally tends towards, which basically think in terms of supply and demand curves. Okay, the intersection of the two is your natural rate of unemployment in the labour market, uh, along with the assumption that you're, you're rational as well, so you can predict what's going to happen if the government tries to do something. Uh, it means that ultimately there's no possibility for fiscal policy. Now, that might seem crazy. I do think it is crazy. And I explain why I debunked in economics. But that was the common belief across all the neoclassical economists before the financial crisis hit. So it's not particularly amazing with that attitude that they didn't see the financial crisis coming. And in fact, if you look at what their models were predicting, and those are the models, these DSGE models that have a, a effectively a start from a single consumer, a single firm, and a central bank trying to make the system reach the natural rate, they actually predicted. Tranquil growth. This is in June of 2007. One of my favourite papers. This guy's going to get masses and masses of citations, not because what he said is so intelligent, because it's so outrageous. You can't help quoting it in virtually every article. So he said, in, in the economic art, this, this is he's the chief economist for the OECD in June of 2007, saying that last autumn, uh, meaning of course the, 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 the December or thereabouts issue of the uh, of the OECD outlook. We took the view that the U.S. slowdown, which was happening at the time, did not herald a period of wide weakness. Recent developments have confirmed this prognosis. The current economic situation is, in many ways, better than we've experienced in years. Now, remember, this is the OECD. This is the most authoritative government economic body in the world. If you're a politician, you're taking what they say seriously because what they write is often written by your own treasury. Okay, there's a bit of a circularity there, but on the basis of this argument, they were told that they expected this to be the future for 2008. Our central forecast is quite benign. A soft landing in the United States, strong and sustained recovery in Europe, strong job creation and falling unemployment. That's June of 2007. Okay. Let's look at what happened. This is unemployment rates across a number of countries, including Australia, by the way, which brags about not having had a recession, but its unemployment rate doubled. Not quite doubled. It increased by 50%. Okay. Those are unemployment rates, and you can see you've got the United States, that's the red one. Big peak, trending down, little peak, trending down, bang. 
This is the UK. High unemployment back in 1992, trending down, bang, up it goes. Not quite as high as 1992. Japan, trending down, rises again. The European Union in general, trending down, rises, hits the highest rate of the lot. Okay, and that's including Germany, which of course has low unemployment. So that's when the OECD said there was going to be strong job creation and falling unemployment. Within two months, they were completely wrong. What you saw across this period, rather than unemployment dropping, it more than doubled in most countries over the next two years. Yeah. So does this account for like the cost of hidden unemployment? No, no, that's 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 worse. Yeah. When you add hidden unemployment, and that gets gets worse again. In fact, the. Um, yeah, that's, I was just thinking about like Japan being virtually full employment. Would they? I mean, they definitely would not have to like part time jobs for people. Well, and in fact, if you go back to the 1990s, Japan's definition of full employment was about one percent. You can see here it's about two percent. So Japan rose from two percent. Get the mouse to come back again. Two percent here, up to about six five and a half percent. That's quite high unemployment for Japan. Then it started trending down until the crisis hit, and it was right back up to the previous peak. Okay. But I, I just have a question because wasn't the dot com boom like? Hey guys, my hearing is bad, so you don't mind asking. Hello. Right. Sorry, they're asking a question. I really, my hearing is so bad, I can't hear over the noise. It's fine. Yeah. Asking, like the dot com boom must have been like around that time. So why wasn't it? Oh, wasn't it? Like, two thousand. Yeah. It crashed in two thousand. We're talking two thousand and eight. But it's an important point about unhidden unemployment. Uh, later on, I'll bring, up the, I'll bring up the definitions of unemployment that the American government uses and show how they contrast. But even with this U3, U which is the measure I'm showing here, doesn't take into account hidden unemployment. Okay. And even that more than double. Yeah, because it's always like a huge time. That's right. Yeah, and that's actually, there's a, there's, I'll actually show that comparison in a moment. It's worth, worth taking a look at. So that was, a crisis was completely unexpected. It wasn't predicted by the models. Okay. It wasn't anticipated by the politicians or their advisors, so it was a hell of a shock. And four things happened. Uh, first of all, what we call automatic stabilisers kicked in. Because you had a fall in, in GDP, there was an increase in unemployment, increase in welfare payments, and a fall in tax revenue. So the budgets went into deficit quite massively. And this is data from the world in the uh, White House, not yet affected by Donald Trump. Uh, and this is looking at the average surplus of the American government from 1900 to today. And as you can see, from 1900 to the First World War, it went a balanced budget, huge deficit during the First World War, a sustained surplus during the 1920s. Now, think about that, because often people think you should save money for a rainy day, but you don't want saving money to cause a storm, do you? What actually happened here, 10 years of running a budget surplus, the next 10 years were the worst 10 years in the history of capitalism. So what happened after that? You had the government goes into deficit, roughly equivalent to 5% of GDP during the Great Depression, tries to get back into surplus again, reaches a balanced budget, then goes into enormous deficit, 25% of GDP. What do you think is happening then? <coughs> World War II. Okay. Nobody's worrying about the budget. You're trying to defeat the Nazis. Back into surplus again, and then across this period, there, there's zero. Zero, by the way, is there. That's a balanced budget. What do you think is the average over the over the last century? The average government surplus. What do you reckon it roughly is? Over how long? Sorry. Over the last hundred last hundred and twenty years. Okay. It's not more than one anyway. It's about minus three. Okay. The governments sustainably run a deficit about about minus two point eight percent. I think if you take out the wars, it's minus two point six. So the normal situation for the government has been a deficit of about 2.5% of GDP. Notice over here we have a surplus, back into deficit again, and then the financial crisis hits. Now, you look at the scale of it. This is what's called the New Deal. Remember the New Deal? History lessons? Yeah. Tennessee, electrification, Hoover Dam. Okay, lots and lots of stuff. Obama's stimulus was twice as big. The deficit there hit minus 10% of GDP. Deficit back at the time of the New Deal was only half that size. Now, do you remember, are there any giant projects out of Obama's expenditure? Yeah. You can think of any, any huh? Bailing out the banks is where most of the money went. That's true. But this is actually government spending, which is additional to that bailing out the banks. So that came from the central bank. So even though this is what we remember, and this has got no memory at all in terms of large projects, 
Obama's stimulus was twice the scale of the New Depression, the, the, the New Deal during the Great Depression. Reason being, the government was five times the size. If you go back to the 1930s, the 1920s, and look at the scale of government spending as a percentage of GDP, it was about one fifth what it is now. So there wasn't the room for that huge expansion. It was mainly the, the size of the government. And that's when Hyman Minsky focuses upon. Now, on top of that, they also had things like cash for clunkers, which was actually pretty small, but that was giving money money for crap cars. Okay. Pardon? No, it was, you still remember it, don't you? And TARP, the Travel Asset Rescue Program. Now, what was really done was rescuing the banks. And this is quite intriguing looking at Obama's speech from April 2009. It's another one I, I quote very frequently. It's a public speech. And he was talking to a... To a the typical, this is a typical Obama speech. You can almost see the rhythm of the way he speaks here. There are a lot of Americans who think that government money would be better spent going directly to families and businesses instead of banks. Where's our bailout, they ask. He then says something straight out of your tech, economic textbook. A dollar of capital in a bank can actually result in 8 or $10 of loans to families and businesses, a multiplier effect that can lead to a fast rate of economic growth. So he's actually relying upon the money multiplier there. Do you think that, huh? that he's wrong because a dollar of capital is not going to make eight or ten dollars of loans? That multiplier effect is ridiculous. Well, that's 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 like yeah, that's talking about a ten times multiplier. But that's what he's that's what he's thinking in terms of. And he, do you think he knew this stuff himself before he became prime president? What, what was his training? He was a seller, wasn't he? He was a lawyer. I doubt that he knew the economics. Yeah. Okay, the same thing, yeah, okay. It's, it's a big multiplier effect. I'll show you a smaller one in a moment, but it's still based on the idea that a, a dollar given to a bank will generate more than one dollar in terms of loans, which create money in the private economy, okay? So it's very much relying on the money multiplier there. Now, what they did uh, also, in addition to this idea, was a huge boost to government to uh, base money. And this is because Ben Bernanke really blamed the Great Depression on the Federal Reserve, which is quite funny because he wrote that before he became chairman of the Federal Reserve, and then he was chairman of the Federal Reserve when it went into the biggest crisis since the Great Depression. Certain justice there. But his argument was, when you look at his essays on the Great Depression, that there's overwhelming evidence, he said, that the main factor with depressing aggregate demand was a worldwide contraction in, contraction in world money supplies. So why did world money supply fall? So he said it's the result of a poorly managed and flawed international monetary system. The main thing he said was it's the Fed's policy choices that caused it. So he's blaming the organisation at this stage he was a member of and not long after he became the, to the chairman of. And he said the United States is the only country in which the discretionary component of policy, so what the Federal Reserve actually did itself, and he's talking about the Reserve here, not the, not the Treasury, was to signal de was destabilising. The ratio of monetary base to international reserves fell from 1928 through to 1931, and he blames the fall in base money and that ratio of, of base money to, uh, to, wide, to wide, wide money as the actual cause of the recession. So when he goes, nominal money growth was precisely zero between 1928 and 1929. So that's the fourth sector, so he's talking, I think, in... American terms, they, they, when's their fourth sector? It's December, isn't it? I'm not sure. What's their What's their financial year? I think I think it's the last three months of the year, calendar months. Okay. Year 1930 was even worse. He says between 1929-4 and 1934, nominal money fell by six percent, even as gold stocks increased. So he was using a whole set of ratios in this book, in this article, by the way. He broke down the money supply into the the money supply divided by, by base money, uh, multiplied by base money, multiplied by gold, multiplied by gold, multiplied by international reserves, a whole set of, of factors like that. And then he tried to say which of these factors had more impact. That was the basis of his analysis. And notice what he's saying here. The proximate cause of this decline in M1. What's M1? Pardon? It's part of the money supply, but it's very, very, very important to learn the definitions because... Do you think there's M0 as well? So does M1 contain M0? you think? Who reckons M1 contains M0? I did. I'm wrong. Okay, it doesn't. M0 is base money, which is money either held in the reserve accounts of the central banks or in the vaults of the private banks, not actually lent out to the public, whereas M1 is fundamentally check accounts. 
So M1 is money created by private banks. But here is Bernanke blaming the fall in M1 on the Federal Reserve. So you must have a theory that says the Federal Reserve somehow controls the amount of lending that banks do, and that's the money multiplier. So he said, the contraction in the ratio of base to reserves reinforced rather than offset declines in the money multiplier. And he finally says, this locates much of the blame for the early slowdown with the Federal Reserve. Now, he had no idea that he was going to face uh, the in the chair when this crisis hit. I'm sorry, actually, there's one actually quote I should have found, but I'm sure I can find it quickly. Just give me a sec to find it because it's in some ways it's priceless. Uh, because Ben Bernanke was a great fan of, of Friedman's uh, birthday, of, of, of Melton Friedman. So, okay, I'll just make this a bit larger so you can see it. This is him talking uh, at Milton Friedman's 90th birthday, which was, let's see that was, that was uh, November 2002, so not a long time before the crisis, about five, about five years. He says at the end of it, I'll link this article in again later, There you go. Let me end my talk by abusing slightly my status as an official rep of the Federal Reserve. I'd like to say to Milton and Anna, regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it. We're very sorry. But thanks to you, we won't do it again. Okay? So he wasn't aware at all that he was going to face a crisis like this himself. But when it hit, he took his theory quite seriously and made an enormous increase in base money. And this is before they started QE, by the way. QE comes in later. But here's what actually happened. That's what's called the St. Louis Adjusted Monetary Base. It's a few mathematical calculations to avoid double counting and various other important things to do. Notice that there's, I'm going from 1920 right out to 2000. And over that entire period, it rises from close to zero to about a trillion dollars. And then in one month, it virtually doubles. And these are the increases he did. So it went from virtually zero back in 1960s to about a trillion when the crisis hit, and then two trillion, three trillion, four trillion. So quadruple, more than quadruple in just a couple of years. And this, this phase here is before they started QE. The other stuff here is what QE has added. Okay? So it's an enormous scale. Well, let's take a look at it another way, looking as a percentage of GDP. Again, this is the FRED database. So I'll, I'll put these slides up on, on study space when I'm finished. And, of course, you know if you just type that, you'd actually try it right now. If you type, can you see the little text on the bottom there? I think that's a brilliant system, by the way. I really, actually, I'm just on the Mark the Essays for the, the um, Contemporary Issues class. And lots of them took the lead from this, this lecture last year, from Deborah's lecture last year, and started using the Fed database to produce their charts. And that's fabulous because as a, as a lecturer, to check what somebody, somebody's written, all you've got to do is type that. First of all, you know that if you see this style, you know it's genuine data. Okay? That's a great advantage. It's not just something you picked up off the internet. And secondly, if you want to check it yourself, you just type those characters in there, handful of characters, and bang, you've got the chart complete with all the calculations that might lie behind it. For this one, you notice up the top it's saying St. Louis adjusted monetary base divided by GDP multiplied by 100. Okay? So that's the formula that I've put in very, very simply. So really do learn that database. It's a fabulous database. But notice what's going on here. Look back before the, um, the 1930s. Back in the 1930s, the level of uh, reserves compared to GDP was of, of the order of 5%. It rose during the Great Depression reached a high peak, and then it's been falling all the way through the post-war period. A slight rise from 1980 to about 2000, and then bang, that's the impact of, first of all, the increasing reserves that Bernanke did, and then QE afterwards. So it's now gone from of the order of 7% of GDP before the crisis began to three times that. That's the scale of increase. Now, what about um, dear old England? Much the same story. In fact, even more radical in some ways. Okay, that's the level of base money in the United Kingdom, 40, 40 billion dollars or forty billion pounds in before the crisis began, ten times that now. Okay. 
Mervyn King. And was obviously a very rapid increase when Mervyn King was in charge, also being to caught totally by surprise by the crisis. And now looking at his percentage of GDP, a similar sort of thing. And fortunately, this is longer term data. Notice that from 1870 through to about 1940, the ratio of base money to GDP was about 12%. About one, it's a pretty high ratio. We then had it rising during, well, pardon me, we had it rising during the First World, the Second World War, but then it's uniformly plunged to a tiny level. So there's something very different about this period to this period. Okay. And what they saw as normal across this period was actually an erosion of what was normal beforehand. Well, again, another reason why it's really useful to use long-term data to see how capitalism has changed over time. Now, the rationale for the reserves was to stimulate the economy by the money multiplier. And I've linked, I've linked that through to the Wikipedia, but that gives you all the, all the information you need. And here's Obama's speech, the idea of a dollar's worth of capital having a multiplier effect of eight to ten times in, in, the, later, in the economy itself. And it's based on the model you've learnt. And the basic idea goes if you add to the reserves of private banks, they then have excess reserves. They'll end up a multiple of the excess reserves through a, a chain reaction process. And that'll stimulate the economy. So this is a, I just found this one on a, on a, on a website. Um, I couldn't find the actual author of the website, which has been annoying, but it's the best I could find in a bit of a hurry. So you add reserves to the bank, and then the first bank hangs on to the required ratio, which might be, say, 10% of the deposits, and lend out the remainder. I've got 20% here. The American data, by the way, if you click on that link, it'll take you through to the Federal Reserve. Let's just take a look at that. And that's the Federal Reserve statement about its monetary requirements. So it's got a 10% reserve ratio, but be careful, it's not 10%. Okay, It's 10% of something, not 10% of everything. And the, but the idea is they hang on to that percentage, they'll end out the rest, and by a chain reaction you get money created that way. So here's an example from uh, a website. I'll just bring this spreadsheet up. It's not very well explained, I'm afraid to say, but it's, it'll do for the purposes. This is a, a little website explaining the logic, and if you click on moneycree.xls, you'll get the file, which now comes down here, and I'll bring it up here. Can you see that? Oh, great. Protected. I can't edit the damn thing. God, I, I, I just love I love Microsoft for that reason. They make life so easy. So I'll so see so so if I can type fingers in here, and no, I can't type anything in. Great. Okay. I thought I had it linked there properly to a live version on my computer, but obviously not. What I've got here is imagine you have 100 extra units, 800 million pumped into the 100 billion pumped into the reserves uh, with a reserve cash ratio of 20%. So of that 100 billion, people hang on to 20 million in, in or 20 million in cash. Uh, then 80, I'm getting my billions and millions mixed up. So let's say 100 dollars in, they hang on to 20, 80 gets deposited and the reserve ratio is 0.1, that argues you have an overall multiplier, and this is why your point about the number being rather high that Obama used, of 3.57. So the basic idea is $100 in creates $357 of additional money in the economy, which is spent, of course. That's how it stimulates the economy. That's the basic logic. But when they, this is what happened to the money multiplier in practice. Okay. This is the ratio of M, M1 to M0. Now, notice the first of all, there's a downward trend right from the 80s on. The ratio of 3 to 1 down to 1.5 before the crisis began. Look what happened in the crisis. It fell off a cliff. And after the crisis, it's actually below 1. Now, that's why I said it's important to know that M0 and M, M1 does not contain M0. So M0 are the reserves. M1 is the money created by the banking system in immediate what we call checkable accounts. So that's, that's the collapse. So they tried to make this grow, but nothing happened. So what's going wrong? Well, if you take a look at the transcripts, and this is one of the beauties, again, of the time you guys are doing economics. Back when I was doing it, there was no access to find out what, the, what the, all the official bodies thought. You could read working papers, which you'd find physically in the library. You wouldn't find them online. Okay? But you could not read the actual transcripts. Now you can get the actual transcripts. And you'll find the Fed... And these, these are all people who are professors of economics, most of them. Most of the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank chairs who are conventional professors of economics who build the sort of models I'm talking about. But Bernanke gave a speech in London back in 2009. And he said that 
there's a worry they all had was by expanding the money supply that much, according to the money multiplier, they should be generating a huge potential for inflation. Okay? If you increase that much money in the economy, $100 becomes $400. Okay? And you would not read talking not $100, we're talking $1 trillion, which becomes $4 trillion. They were worried about a huge inflationary surge. And most of the time, that's what their discussions were about. So some observers expressed the concern that by expanding its balance sheet, the Fed's effectively printing money, which can not be inflationary. And there's been a large increase in excess reserves. So they say bank reserves together with currency make up the narrowest definition of money. Okay, that's the bank accounts that the banks have at the central bank plus cash. Okay, they have a cash and total circulation by the looks of that. That's the monetary base, and that's risen substantially. So banks are choosing to leave the great bill of the excess reserves idle. So the idea is the banks aren't lending out these reserves and they're puzzling as to why. And you find the same thing when you look inside the discussions that they're having about, you know, why are we not having the impact upon the economy we thought we'd have? This is Ralf Schneider. Is that close? Anybody tell me I got the German okay? The Ralf Schneider, I guess. He's the stat one of the statisticians in the Federal Reserve. So he's sitting on the board as an observer giving feedback to the Federal Open, Mon Open uh, Monetary Committee FOMC, I keep forgetting what those initials stand for, giving them background about what has happened in the past. And it said Japan did a similar thing. And the thought was if you pile up excess reserves, banks won't want, want them yours, so they begin to lend them. So the idea you can lend reserves, which you guys have learned in the money model fine, you've accepted, and there's nothing wrong with that, okay, because you have to see a bit deeper to understand why it's wrong, and I'll show you that in the second half of the lecture. Um, so that's what they all thought would happen. They said it didn't happen. It didn't happen in Japan. The experience was that it never happened. So Japan has done the same thing. Remember, Japan had its crisis in 1990. That's 18 years before the Americans had their crisis. So there's plenty of Japanese data for them to look at, and they're all analysing Japan and trying to work out what happened there. But they said, we thought, could it work this way? Would the same thing happen in America? And we've learned a lot from the experience. It seems as though you can run up excess reserves to a tremendous amount, and Janks will just accept it. So banks do nothing with the reserves, and they're blaming the banks for it, yeah. Here's why they haven't had negative interest rates. Yes, exactly. They're trying to drive them down. They're trying to... Yeah. Okay. So what they're saying is you can run up a tremendous excess reserves, and banks just accept that they don't seem to do anything with it. And this is the president of the Richmond Fed. Now, all these guys have said are the professors of economics, people like myself, no, not like me, I wouldn't get a job there in a million years, but professors of universities being taken on to run Federal Reserve Department, uh, Federal Reserve branches. There's 13 different um, regional branches to the Federal Reserve, and these reach the presidents. They sit on the FOMC. So the reason I ask about this is talking about the, the impact of inflation. The usual prediction with this amount of reserves would lead to an explosion in M2, an explosion of lending, a burst in inflation. Yeah. M2 is basically savings accounts. So M1 is check accounts. In the old old definition, before we got all the complicated accounts we have these days, M1 was the sort of thing you could draw a check on and then therefore transfer money by paper to somebody else, but you paid, you got no interest on the on the bank account. M2 includes savings accounts where you got paid interest, but normally there was a bit of a time lag in whether you can access them. That that division has become less important over time, but M2 is a broader definition of money. And thank you. For, please interrupt me like that when I put a term you haven't seen before. That's good. They said, said they've gone up by $200 billion. Um, so we're not just reserve, substituting reserves for debt. We've actually increased the amount of reserves they've got. Okay. But banks have increased their demand for liquid assets. It looks like what he's saying, in other words, a huge increase in reserves. They've just hung on to it. Maybe they want more liquidity. Why haven't they lent it out? He says, we aren't getting this money multiplier effect. Okay. Now, are you starting to see that there might be something wrong with the model itself? Two countries, two crises, money multiplier not working. Okay. Something strange is going on, at least according to the theory. But they were still worried about this causing runaway inflation. This is another one of the more conservative members of the board from Philadelphia. He said, uh, maybe the road is going to be more robust than we expect. And this is writing back in 2009. How do you reckon his expectations have worked out? Not particularly rational, are they? He hasn't forecast the future at all accurately. Uh, maybe they'll uh, we need to reduce the degree of accommodation sooner rather than later, which of course they haven't done. Um, 
what we might get, uh, if, if we make the cost of hanging on to vast excess reserves, it might lead to a rapid increase in the money multiplier and a conversion of excess reserves into loans or borrowed money. Now, they're really thinking the way you've been taught to think in the first year. Okay? More elaborate versions, but they're accepting all the stuff you're taught about the, the money multiplier. Now, this is Richard Fisher, again, one of the most conservative members of the Dallas, Texas. As long as you have trillions of excess dollars sloshing around, the funds rate and the interest rate and excess reserve, so they have two separate rates there, have to move much in the same direction with the rate on excess reserves being the real determinant of the bank's willingness to lend out reserves. Okay. So it's all well and truly in the mindset that you guys have just been taught about the money multiplier. And he said, I'm not sure about the potential success we have about bringing this stuff back off the bank, off the balance sheets if, if we get inflation. But clearly the money multiplier failed in Japan it failed during the crisis, and it's failed after the crisis. Otherwise, if it had worked, there'd be an enormous increase in the money supply and a huge amount of economic activity. So it's failed. The reason it's failed is it can't work in the first place. It's mathematically false. By mathematically, I mean the way accountants work. I need to explain that to you. Now, you find there's a wonderful paper done by the Bank of England about two years ago, and this is highly recommended reading, it doesn't actually go into the, the, into the macroeconomics so much, but it goes into money creation. And it starts with a summary. The reality of how money is created differs today from descriptions found in some economic textbooks. Some, by the way, is a code for all. Yeah. You'll only find two or three books that don't teach this model. Rather than banks receiving deposits and then lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. And in normal times, the central bank does not fix the amount of money in circulation nor is central bank money multiplied up into more loans and deposits. That's directly contradicting what you've just been taught in principles. Okay? And that's not an uncommon thing. Every university in the world teaches this model, with a couple of exceptions. Or well, they teach, you know, there's six, I'm one of the ones that teaches and say it's wrong. The same for the uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City. But after all this happened, this Federal Reserve started to check and say, well, what's going on? Does it actually exist? And in this paper, the Federal Reserve Research Paper, which you're going to link there, simple textbook treatments give the quantity of bank reserves a causal role in determining the quantity of money in bank lending. So it goes from reserves to loans and therefore to the amount of money in the economy. And this results from the assumption that reserve requirements have a direct linkage to money and that the central bank controls the money supply, all the standard stuff. He said, using recent data, we've shown this is implausible. And the results suggest that an increase in the quantity of reserves is not likely to trigger a rapid increase in lending. So notice how slow the textbooks are. Okay? You're still learning from a textbook that says this money model bar is accurate. Yeah? But if they have both so, uh, understood that it's not working, then why do they have a disease and still going on? I think it's called habit. They really don't want to break out of what they've been doing in the past. So QE is a slight extension of what they've done previously. But to actually make take a leap into the unknown, they're afraid. Mm -hmm. I think they're simply afraid of trying something different. And I want to show you how, how limited what they've actually done has been in terms of its impact upon the economy. But, yeah. Pardon? Uh, well, you could, do, you could do what it's been called people's quantitative easing. Because what's being done with QE is basically increasing the reserves of banks by buying bonds off the banks. So the, the first thing you saw, that massive increase under under uh, Bernanke back in 2009, what he was doing is basically putting entries inside the bank's deposit accounts, the reserve accounts, and matching it with a loan statement. But when it came to QE, what they're doing, they'd buy bonds off the banks. So the banks would have government bonds, and they'd buy the government bonds off them, or the banks might have mortgage-backed securities, private, private bonds that the banks themselves had issued, the central bank would buy that off them as well. So it's just, it's just a change in how they actually make the entry in the reserve accounts of the banks, but it's fundamentally the same action, just funded uh, funded in a different way. But it fails. Well, the reason is banks cannot lend out reserves. It's technically impossible for them to do it. Wow. I'm about to show you. We might get halfway through and then we'll um, we'll take a break and come back and all this. It's just going to be slightly mind-bending for you because it violates accounting laws. Anybody here studying accounting? Nobody doing any accounting here? Okay. 
I didn't do it at university either. I learned it the hard way, writing the software package I'm going to show you in a short while. But to explain it, I've got to explain double-entry bookkeeping. So nobody here has done double-entry bookkeeping. I've heard of it. You've heard of it. Has anybody the been? Debit and the credit. Pardon? The debit and the credit. Debit and the credit. Debit and credit. Yeah. Debit and credit and balance, making sure it balances. It's it's simply a way that was invented by by the very first accountants back in the 1500s as a way of making sure transactions were, up, were accurately recorded by a double check. And I'll show you the basic logic of it. If you want to see the history, there's a fabulous book by an Australian author, Jane Gleeson White, called Double Entry, How the Merchants of Venice, notice that's the phrase that, uh, that, that uh, Shakespeare used, shaped the modern world. Okay. And she talks about how their idea of how to accurately record financial transactions led to the way we think about money and capitalism today. But the essential idea was making sure you accurately recorded transactions by entering each transaction twice. Okay. Once as an asset, second time as a liability or equity. And the basic idea is one is a positive. When you add something to your own holdings, you've increased your assets, that for you is a positive. Okay. Um, but if you, if you increase your liabilities, that's a negative. And what's an asset for somebody is going to be a liability for somebody else. So the idea is to record them both on the same line and make sure they balance to zero. Now, the way that accountants do it is use debits and credits, which I'm not going to use. I'm going to show you another way of doing it, which I think is simpler. But they have three sorts of accounts. An asset account, that's a and they show that that's a positive for you. Your bank account, for example, is an asset for you, but it's a liability for the bank. Okay? So it's sensible for you when you're writing up your own book balance and see how much you're worth to record your, your bank account as a positive for yourself, the cash in your pocket as a positive for yourself. Okay, Those are assets. A liability is a negative. So if you have a credit card bill, it's sensible to show the credit card as a negative for you. It's a liability. You owe that to somebody else. And the difference between the two is your net equity. So if you subtract your liabilities from your assets, you have your net equity, which you might hope is positive. And that's what they call the, the, the fundamental law of accounting, that assets minus liabilities equals equity. You'll also see this assets minus liabilities equals capital. Same, same, it's the same concept, different words for it. So I'm going to use those terms there, A minus L equals E. Simple? Okay. So that's the basic idea. You want to make sure you keep this record straight to work out what your net worth is. And if, of course, you therefore take the E over the other side, A minus L minus E equals zero. So there's your check. Okay. You want to make sure that row always sums to zero. So far, so good? Okay. Now, the next part of this is how do you go about doing it? Well, I mean, you mentioned debits and credits. They use this, and I just find it confusing beyond belief. Funnily enough, the software package I've designed to do this, we had a third-party guy. So like, I'll, I'll, I'll code debits and credits for you rather than what you're using, so accountants can use it as well. He said, yeah, sure, go and do it. He did the code. About six months later, we got an accountant telling him he got the debits and credits confused. Okay, so I find I find them confusing, and a lot of people learn in doing accounting is knowing when you call something a debit, when you call a credit, on the different columns it will be put into. The convention I use is to show assets as a positive, which makes sense. Fair enough. Liabilities are negative. That also makes sense. The part that's a bit weird is show equity is negative as well. Okay, that does look strange, but you'll see why because it ensures that all runs sum to zero. We're starting with this equation, a minus, L, a minus L minus E equals zero, but that only applies where I define both a, all, all three, assets, liabilities, and equities, all shown as positive sums. Okay? If I showed any of those negative, I'd, I'd violate that equation, so I'm treating them all as positive here. But I've just told you that you should regard liabilities as negative. That's the clue. So if you define assets to be positive... <coughs> and both liabilities and equities to be negative, okay, so the negative quantities, then you can do exactly the same equation by adding them up and replace all the pluses with a minus. And now you have A plus L, we define as a negative, plus E, which you define as a negative, must be equal to zero. Get the idea? Okay, it's slightly counterintuitive, but it's the same thing engineers have to learn when they work learn, they start learning, laying out circuit boards because... Circuit boards in electronics will show electric charge moving from positive to negative terminals, even though we define electrons to be negative, and they're the ones doing the moving. Okay, so it's the same sort of intuition that engineers have to use, and I've built them into a software package called Minsky, which I've shown you a few times, 
uh, that's a link to download the software. I do recommend downloading it and getting used to playing with it because it will teach you a lot over time, I think you'll find. Now, what we end up doing with that is modeling the way that banks actually create money. So uh, let's see how we're going on time here. So what I might do, let's, let's actually take a bit of a break now, five, ten minute break, and come back and I'll show you how this actually works and why the reserve money multiplier doesn't make sense. Yep. Oh, yeah. It was pretty sick to save this file. We've got to make sure I save it, otherwise, I might lose the, uh, lose the recording. <laughs> 